I don't know if you know this, but we just had a Champions League final played the other day. I wasn't able to live stream that game like I normally like to because I was at work while the game was uh, being played. But trust me, I watched that entire the entirety of that match while I was on the clock. Don't tell my supervisor. Now, Pep Guardiola um, changed his tactics up in this match. And so that's what I'm going to be learning about in today's video. How Pep changed his tactics to win the Champions League. There's going to be a tactical analysis by um, Football Made Simple. So here we go. Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. Manchester City are champions of Europe following a tightly contested final with the Rodri goal deciding matters. Right, the and Inter definitely uh, bottled this. There is a player whom I will not name his name uh, because he's taken enough shade, enough flack over the last few days. Um, much of it from me. <laughs> I thought that the, the Inter, they, they had more opportunities to win the game and they bottled every single chance that they had. Uh, at scoring, whether it was Lukaku or it was um, Lataro Martinez, he had a chance, and um, you know th there were several opportunities that they had um, to make good on this game, and they did not. So here we go. XG swung in Inter's favor with several close-range shots, impossibly staying out. Pep changed up his tactics in this match, but what tactics did we see from both managers? Let's take a look, beginning with City on the ball. City's 3-2 shape in the build-up has been the focus of much conversation over the last two months, with Stones Me pushing too. up alongside Rodri, allowing City to form a midfield box. All right, so they don't. I thought they ran a 4-3-3. Looks like this year they've been running actually more of like a 3-2. A I'm kind of curious about this. They're they're running uh, a back line of three players, um, pushing up Stones and Rodri um, as sort of your defensive midfield. De Bruyne and Gundogan are your, um, I guess, attacking midfielders. Grealish and uh, Bernardo Silva on the, the wings. And then Holland right there in the middle uh, as the striker to kind of receive um, receive the ball and attack, basically. So, all right. So, this is what they've been running uh, for most of this, he this season. That looked like this. However, if City had stuck to this shape, Inter's natural shape... Was perfect oh, yeah. to counter. So right here, we definitely have numbers. We've got a numbers mismatch because you've got that middle, um, that middle, the midfielders here. You've got a four on five um, happening here, and let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think through this as a coach. Um, if Gundogan or De Bruyne try to go out to the to the wings, which, or, which happens a lot. I see City running De Bruyne over to that, to the right side of the pitch a lot, and he tries to create from that side. Um, if they do that, and Holland tries to to take up that middle space there, Brozovic is right there, and he, he's going to have that covered. So um, this five this five on four scenario actually removes. Holland's ability to be Holland right there in the middle, so um, that's a problem. The city's tactics when they look to make the most of their central overload, as the front two could sit in on the double pivot, whilst Barella and Chalanoglu could easily look after the men higher up in the half spaces, making it more of a four versus four. Hmm. In addition, where we've often seen Gundogan and De Bruyne push wide to create a lane for yes, Holland to potentially drop into, Brozovic would also be perfectly positioned to stop that. So Pep looked to switch his shape slightly, still sticking with the back three in the build-up, but now Rodri operated as a single pivot. And instead, De Bruyne operated much wider left, Stones almost as an ah. eight on the right-hand side, and Gundogan was the attacking midfielder initially. Although when De Bruyne went off injured, Foden then took up the central attack. All right, so Pep, had, he's setting up a, a sort of diamond here, a diamond shape in the middle. Instead of having an overload with I guess two sets of pivots he's running a single pivot with Rodri and and then I don't know is Foden considered a pivot I don't know I might be using terminology that I'm well like I, I'm I'm in the deep end guys like I'm I'm diving into this tactic thing but I also am still learning midfield role with Gundogan wide left 
So, City played with a 3-4-3 diamond, somewhat reminiscent of Johan Cruyff. And that shape is exemplified here with the usual back three, but now, instead, Stones and De Bruyne are operating much wider, allowing them to have this diamond. Yep. The idea behind this may have been that with Inter looking to occupy the central regions and prevent any play through the middle third, which they did succeed in, Gundogan and Stones could operate in these wider regions, potentially being the outlets. However, Inter's defence was phenomenal throughout the final, and Barella and Chalinoglu were disciplined in closing down these men when needed. But as we'll see, City did have some solutions to this. Inter Milan should also be commended, as they were highly aggressive in this press, so we rarely saw this situation with Dzeko and Martinez just looking to sit deeper. Instead, Martinez often looked to press Akanji down the left-hand side, with Dzeko looking to press Diaz. But in order to continue this man-to-man -man press, Barella, who is a dynamo, was tasked with shifting up and down the pitch, and as soon as Ake would receive, he would look to apply the pressure, so that the city centre-backs never had time to get their heads mm. up, and were playing to Inter's pressing tempo, rather than putting their foot on the ball to draw the presses. We see that exact scenario here with Checo. Wow, and oh wow, yeah, so these guys are pressing with the ball in motion, so... Uh, your center back has not even received the ball and you're, you're being pressed. So now your Inter is forcing City to play on their terms. I like that. I like that a lot. Martinez pressing. And initially, Ake looks like he could be the free man due to Barella being so deep. But as soon as the ball begins to come across, Barella... Yeah, because then... Um, what was his name? The Dynamo here. He's going after Ake. He's moving up. He's moving up immediately. Like, they're pressing man-to-man. -man, they're pressing before city can get the ball you can you can already see them in motion as the ball is being being played so it's not giving city the um op, the the advantage or upper hand here they're having to play reactionary that has shifted perfectly so he can immediately apply pressure onto nathan ake these shapes were not perfect however as oftentimes we would see brozovic closing down rodri but he could stay deeper but the main focus is when Ake received, it meant that Gundogan could be in this interesting position, in that space outside yeah. the midfield, because Barella was now higher rather than covering Gundogan's movements. So occasionally we did see Gundogan able to receive, turn, and then drive up the pitch. But this was actually rare, because once again, Inter defense was prepared. And by using the back three, they often had spare men in the defensive phase, and Darmian almost operated as a free centre-back at times, following his men much deeper on the pitch at will, meaning that Gundogan for the most part did not have the time to drive up the pitch, even when he did receive. So here's an example of that situation, with De Bruyne finding space because Barella was looking to press high. And as you can see, Darmian already has one eye on De Bruyne, ready to press him should he progress. Hmm. But this situation still did leave a gap in the defensive phase though, with Grealish keeping Dumfries deeper and wider. And particularly when Foden came on, he was much more willing to exploit these gaps with runs from deep than De Bruyne was. So, we did see him begin to receive the ball in interesting situations, particularly in the second half. So here we see just that. Ake draws Barella, Damian on Gundogan who's dropping into that space, and keep an eye on De Bruyne from attacking midfield, who then makes a run into the vacated space via Haaland, and might have gotten into a dangerous yep. situation. So what this would mean is that at times Inter Milan had to be more conservative, with Darmian looking to stay deeper and Barella being more dedicated mm. to picking up the man in the midfield. This would not be too bad if the Inter front two was well set and could still prevent Ake pushing higher up the pitch. However, if they were caught central, the occasions where the wide centre-backs were able to progress past this first line were disastrous, as they allowed situations where they would begin Can to... Add trying to understand all of this and I think I think I'm getting there but um, the more and more I watch videos like this the more I start to see it happening when the game is being played I watched the entirety of this game so he's mentioning moments that I saw in the game and I'm able to kind of track what was happening um, while I'm watching it I'm not able to see the tactics at play I'm just watching the game unfold but watching the the replay of this and watching it being explained i remember the plays in question so this is actually extremely helpful be an overload against inter milan so this could either mean a midfielder being dragged across and the rest of the midfield having to react 
and oftentimes it meant that stones on the far side could then be free to receive. Alternatively, in rarer instances, it could be the wider Stones is all over the place in this game. Again, creating that gap. And in fact, the goal shows shades of this. So the play breaks down, and is one of the rare instances Inter don't have the chance to get into a set shape. So Akanji can easily progress outside the front too. What this now means, with the midfield not having the time to shift across, is that Bastoni is drawn higher, creating the space for Bernardo Silva to make the run and get on the end of it. The midfield then has to cover the runners, creating space mm. here that Rodri takes advantage of. But I believe there may have been a secondary reason. Yeah, they, they left so the much shape. open space there. Usually against teams that play with a back four, City had the five versus four advantage by pushing men up into the half space like this. However, Inter also play with a back five, so this would only have led to a man-to-man -man situation. But now, by switching to this modified shape, with stones pushing up on the outside, there was the opportunity to actually create 6 versus 5 situations if they were able to play the ball quickly. And this would mean there would be the opportunity for potential mm. 2v1 situations against a wing back or at least more controlled 1v1s with runners making progress through the half space. So here you see that front 3 and the 3 just in behind them. As discussed, Damian tends to follow his man deep, meaning the shape is generally much narrower, and this means that there's a potential for a 2 vs 1 on the far side. But for the most part, throughout the 90, Inter's defensive shape was borderline perfect, meaning that City were barely able to create a chance. And Inter weren't just about defending, and even in the offensive phase looked dangerous. In the build-up phase, the presence of Jacko and then Lukaku meant that the longer ball was always an option. However, Onana was key in the build-up, meaning that Inter Milan tended to play out short. And City reverted to a pressing shape they've used Bro, often. I had never seen, or I mean, I guess I hadn't paid attention that much, to see a goalkeeper play outside of the box as much as Onana. He was playing way up the pitch, like close to the half, the half field mark. Um, and I kept thinking, man, they're going to they're gonna take advantage of him being this far out. But it, it never actually, yeah turned into that. Especially in the Champions League, Barella tended to push right up into the front line almost as an extra attacker, meaning that Brozovic and Chalinoglu were the front two. These men were picked up by the City front two with Foden slash De Bruyne pushing up alongside Haaland, and Grealish and Bernardo were the wider men. However, they did not tend to stay wide, and instead, when the ball was live, looked to come from out to in to press their man and prevent progression. And this could be effective at times mm. if they manage to press aggressively enough to cut off that initial passing lane over them. So here we see that city shape in a more open play situation, but the principles are the same as Bernardo and Grealish have the onus of pressing the wider centre backs whilst De Bruyne and Haaland pick up the pivots because Barella is so high. And here Bernardo presses aggressively enough that Bastoni can't change mm. his body orientation to find the pass over him. However, Onana's distribution is excellent, which meant that time and again, they were able to find the wing back over the winger, leading to a lot of danger. And Inter immediately identified this weakness and looked to make the most of it. Often, not just keeping Dumfries wide, but also looking to shift Barella into a wider position so that they could have a 2 versus one against Ake, which could look dangerous. We see it again here, the City front four, and now Ake, is isolated two versus one against Barella and Dumfries if the ball comes across. Again, even in open play, this system was consistently causing problems for Manchester City because of the positioning of these aggressive wingers on the wider centre backs, as often Inter would build one side, which would force Manchester City to shift across in order to compensate. And with the far side winger, Bernardo in this case, having been aggressive on his centre back, there was always the opportunity for the switch into the wing back on the far side which occurred on Ooh. more than one occasion. On the right-hand side, where they didn't have the presence of Barrett. And then, then you've got to crowd the other side of the pitch, and the guy's going to have to cover such such a, uh, an intense amount of ground. And man, I, I can see how, that, how that's effective, um, because then you have to go into a, uh, to a pressing situation, I think. Martinez would often look to drop deep, creating the room for Dzeko to then look to make inroads down the outside. However, Inter did have their chances, but just couldn't make them count. 
Overall, the Manchester City project is complete, and City have written their name in the history books, and stick around for a tactical analysis of their entire season coming in the next video. For the manager tactical scores, both were excellent, countering each other well, meaning that meaning both managers earn an 8, but drop your ratings down below. I think I don't understand tactics enough to be able to make a decision on the tactics of these managers. I'm just trying to learn still. If you enjoy this kind of content, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Like this video for me uh, so that I'll know um, that, that you guys like these tactical breakdowns. And uh, comment down below and um, that'll just help with the YouTube algorithm, pushing these videos out to more and more people, grabbing a wider audience. We are so close at the time of recording this to hitting 15,000 subscribers. Thank you so much for that. My Patreon links are down in the description below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.